Hi, how's it going? During the first set of Zoom meetups, uh, a number of people asked me, how do you get started? How do you get the foot, your foot in the door? How do you get hired? How do I get Disney to look at my stuff? How do I find a, a couple of graphic design clients, some small businesses, restaurant, anything that, that I, I could do something for to show that there's some potential in this career before my parents make me fly home join the family business and forget about ours. So these are great questions. They're fundamental questions that in school we often don't spend too much time thinking about. We're focused on developing craft, technique, aesthetics, concepts, ideas, so many things. Um, and we often don't get to the hard questions of how do I take all this that I've been developing and am developing and, and get employed. So I have two stories for you. Uh, the first one's about a microphone, and the second one's about an ice bucket. They're both going to sound like, Glenn, these are cute stories, but how does that tell me how to get hired? I think, I'm going to try to explain why I think these stories really do um, give you some insights into how to build a career for the long term. Before I start these, uh, these exciting stories, I want to share a, a movie quotation with you. Uh, Terminator 2, Judgment Day, Linda Hamilton as Sarah Connor. We're in the middle of the film. They've somehow survived the first set of challenges. They're out in the desert, safe for the moment. Um, they're getting a little bit of rest and regrouping for what they know will be a second and even bigger set of challenges. Uh, the Terminator, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and, and Sarah Connor's son are working on a, a, a truck engine and they're also just kind of hanging out and, and bonding and you know telling jokes and stuff. Uh, Sarah Connor's sitting at a wooden picnic table in a dirt field probably carving uh, you know something gloomy in, in the table with a big knife and as she's watching her son and the Terminator interacting and bonding uh, she has this great voiceover. It's my favorite part of the film or maybe the only part of the film that's really uh, anyway, I think part of the answer to how do you get this career going is to be the terminator of your career. And by be the terminator, I don't mean kill your career. I mean have this relentless, will not take no for an answer drive. Don't be a pest. Don't wear yourself out on people, but keep going. Keep knocking on doors. If, if you know, no, it's never fun to hear the answer no. And in the world we live in, more often than you hear no, you're probably just going to be ghosted. You're just not going to hear anything from someone, uh, a person, an organization, whatever, uh, a gallery. But keep going, right? The Terminator gets hit with bullets, gets pushed back, but doesn't turn and run, keeps going forward. So being told no or just being ghosted and feeling like nobody's ever going to respond to you can be these pushes backwards, these little, you know, sort of maybe not punches, we hope, but pushes, but just keep going forward. If, you know, pushing you away is like there's something good up ahead, otherwise we wouldn't be protecting it so much. Um, right? Luke Skywalker flying in the trench to blow up the Death Star. He could fly anywhere else in the galaxy and he wouldn't have all these cannons pointed at him. But the punishment of those cannons is because he's really on to something. He's getting close to something and so there's resistance. There's pushback. So, um, be the terminator of your career. Just keep going. Be analytic if, if you, if you are actually are pursuing a not so promising direction, maybe adjust that, but keep going forward. So here's, uh, here's the Linda Hamilton, Sarah, Quan Sarah Connor quotation as she's watching the Terminator and her son uh, interacting and bonding. Watching John with the machine, it was suddenly so clear. The Terminator would never stop. It would never leave him. It would never hurt him, never shout at him, or get drunk and hit him, or say it was too busy to spend time with him. It would always be there, and it would die to protect him. Of all the would-be fathers who came and went over the years, this thing, this machine, was the only one who measured up. In an insane world, it was the sanest choice. Okay, two stories. Part one, the microphone. Part two, the ice bucket. Um, so I graduated from the University of Hawaii and thought I'd hang around in Hawaii for a while and live and work. 
The living part worked out really well. The working part didn't work out so well. So I came back to California uh, and started reading trade papers, uh, Hollywood Reporter, Daily Variety, probably not the trade sources for your specific career, but they were for what I was doing at the time. Um, and I found a listing that uh, a community college up the coast, uh, Hancock College in Santa Maria, uh, was looking for someone to run the campus television studio. So I applied, got asked to come up for an interview, had a, a good interview. I brought my bag of tricks and a uh, big committee interview. It was kind of intimidating, but fortunately in my little suitcase was some, something to show every person when they asked their question. It went really well. I got offered the job. I went up there and ran the TV studio and also had the chance to teach some television production classes. Taught a bunch of different classes. We produced campus soap operas. It was pretty fun. And through that teaching, uh, met some folks who worked uh, at the, the community theater, the Sa SMCT, the Santa Monica Civic Theater, um, and had a chance to go direct and design a play there. Uh, I chose to do Ibsen's Dollhouse, um, and so I, I, they had a really flexible space, so I, we did a thrust stage, and I designed the set so that the audience is actually in the living room of, the, of their home, um, anyway, so made lots of fancy drawings on, on what that was. Uh, and eventually all this wraps up and I come back down to Los Angeles, I'm reading the trades again, Hollywood Reporter, Daily Variety, and uh, I read that there's an uh, assistant, assistant art director position at NBC Studios in Burbank. So I apply, I get the chance to go up, show my portfolio to Ed Swift, the manager of the art department at that time. Um, I show him some, some set design I'd done in a, in a theater uh, stage design class, some drawings from architectural drafting classes, uh, and then my drawings for this dollhouse and some things I had done at the college, and also I had done an elaborate set for another play, Tally's Folly. So I showed him all these drawings and got hired. So now I'm an assistant assistant art director at NBC. It's pretty cool. And at some point, somebody says, hey, there's an opening uh, on a soap opera over at CBS. You might want to check that out. Uh, so I do. And it turns out what's happened is um, CBS is launching a new soap opera, The Bold and the Beautiful. And the producers of The Bold and the Beautiful have hired the art director of another CBS soap opera, Capital, to be their art director. So now the producers of Capital need to hire a new art director, so they promote their assistant art director, Gary Steele, to be the art director of Capital. So now Gary needs to hire an assistant. Um, so I call him up, I go over, I show him my portfolio. Uh, I've done some cool CAD drafting at NBC in the meanwhile, and uh, we, we hang out, we hit it off, he hires me, very cool. So one of the ways that NBC, uh, CBS uh, lets people make a little extra money is every now and then they have to do these uh, network promos, these bumpers, the 15 second things that go in commercial breaks where the cast of a show appears and says, you know, hey, watch our show, we're funny. Uh, really simple, simple set, not a big soap opera sound stage, but just a little tiny insert stage. Um, Occasionally they design a new set for those things, but most of the time they just set up a set that already exists. So uh, it's a union shop, so there has to be an art director on the thing, so different people get a turn. Uh, so I did network promos, you go in, you can go look at the set that the carpenters have set up if you actually want to, but you don't even have to do that. You just go up to the art department and sign in and you get another day's pay. At, at some point, I'm given uh, the art director job for the CBS coverage of the Rose Parade on January 1st, New Year's Day, which is not a go in for five minutes thing. It's a two weeks hanging out on the corner of Orange Grove and Colorado Boulevard in Pasadena, setting up this big broadcast booth. Um, and like the, the promos, um, they basically use the same booth every year. They had this uh, not so attractive to me red and white striped box thing. Uh, so I took it upon myself, even though I wasn't asked to, to design a new booth. And I, I designed a gigantic chrome CBS eye and the pupil of the eye uh, was the table behind which the celebrity hosts would be sitting. 
And then instead of the black and white CBSI logos that they had at the top of the bleacher areas, I designed some chrome logos. So I showed it to a producer and I'm sure they didn't like literally pat me on the head, but basically they said, yeah, nice, nice drawings, kid. Looks great. Also looks expensive. I think we'll go with the set we already have. Uh, but hey, those chrome logos are cool. Why don't you print some of those and stick them up there? So I go up to Pasadena every day for two weeks to do not very much. Uh, at one point, so there's two booths. There's this huge booth way atop all the bleachers that's the big broadcast booth. And then there's a little tiny street level booth down below right on street level. Uh, and so there's two celebrities at each location. So there was some issue with the street level booth. I don't even remember what it was, but we had to, this truss that was there, we had to take that apart and figure out a new way to hang this canopy. So I worked with one of the carpenters, my favorite carpenter, and we came up with this new thing. And other than that, it was just kind of watch people assemble a thing that already exists. So one day, about eight days before the Rose Parade, um, somebody comes in in the morning for this morning meeting. We're all up in the broadcast booth or down in the parking lot, wherever we were. And somebody says, uh, oh, those NBC guys, they bolted a microphone on the railing right in front of our street level camera. We can't get a shot with this thing. Well, that's outrageous. We're gonna to talk to the Tournament of Roses officials today and we're gonna have them make NBC move that microphone. So this goes on for a week. Every single day, same thing. Come in in the morning, this is NBC microphone. We're gonna to talk to the TVR people again today and make sure they get, and every day, Nothing happens and I just listen and keep my mouth shut. Finally, it's New Year's Eve and the NBC microphone is still right in front of the CBS camera. So with the normal morning, you know, cussing routine, finally I raise my hand and I say, uh, you know, I know the NBC guys. Do you want me to go talk to them? Oh yeah, that'd be great. So I go two flights down from the broadcast booth to the parking lot. 50 feet out to the street, 50 yards up Orange Grove Boulevard, and a half a block down on Colorado Boulevard to like some old gigantic Lions Club building that NBC has rented for their broadcast headquarters. So I walk inside, uh, see a bunch of familiar faces. Hey, how's it going? Hey, how are you? Haven't seen you around for a while. Oh yeah, I got hired on this soap opera over at CBS. Oh wow, congratulations, that's awesome, blah, 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 blah. So we talk for a while and eventually I say, hey, you, you all have a microphone bolted on the rail over on Orange Grove, it's right in front of the CBS camera. Is there any way you could move that three or four feet? Oh yeah, no problem, we'll take care of that right away. So what's it like over at CBS? Is it, is it the same, is it different, what's going on? So I hang out at NBC for 20 minutes and talk uh, and then I leave and go back. And by the time I get back to CBS, the microphone has already been moved. So a week of screaming and cussing and we're gonna make the Tournament of Roses officials make NBC move this and nothing happening. And in 20 minutes of, hey, I know the NBC guys want me to go talk to them, problem solved. So getting that microphone moved may not sound like a story in how to get hired, how to get your foot in the door, how to get connected. But I think it actually is. I think if you think long term, and yes, you want to get started right away, and, and you'd like to be able to pay rent and live a life and graduate and not have to move back in with mom and dad, and, and all of these pressures are kind of pushing on you. But if you think a little bit longer term in terms of building these branches, building these roots, um, it's good to know the NBC guys. It's unlikely in your career that you're ever gonna be art directing the broadcast for the Rose Parade and go ask the NBC guys to move a microphone. But if you, whether it's illustration or animation or graphic design or showing work of any kind in art galleries, if you put the time in to, to develop a community so that you know people, so that when all of these crew people are cussing, we can't get this microphone moved, you say, oh, I know them, why don't I go talk to them? I think that's really how you build a career and you build the connections that you're looking for. Okay, that was story number, that was part one, the microphone. Let's move on to part two, the ice bucket. So I'm 
doing this cool assistant art director gig at CBS on the soap opera Capital. Eventually that show goes off the air, so now I'm looking for work. So I'm flipping through the trades as usual. And I see that, I don't remember what the title of the thing was, but there's some film in pre-production and the production designer, uh, Phil DeGore, is looking to hire an art director, an assistant art director. So I call him up, go on over, show him my portfolio, talk for a while, he likes it, I forget what he sees, but he says, oh, you were at, or maybe it's a resume, I don't know, he says, oh, you were at CBS, yeah, I worked at CBS, wasn't it weird the way the set decorators were treated like gods over there? And it actually was weird, it was it's, it's unusual, it's not the way things normally work, and being young, I didn't really understand that that, that was unusual or, or why it was that way, but as soon as Phil said that, as soon as he gave me permission to think it, and my response is like, Oh yeah, it was so weird. So we have a great conversation and Phil says, you know who you should talk to uh, is Claire Graham down at Disneyland. He's always looking for people. Claire's a he, C-L-A-R-E, Canadian guy. Um, talk to Claire, he's, he's often uh, looking for art directors and designers. So I call up Claire and I say, um, hey Claire, Glenn Zuckman, art director, Phil DeGore suggested that you might like to see my work. Claire says, come on down. Now, actually, the story of getting hired at Disneyland is kind of long and complicated, and you may want to hear it at some point, but to not make this video go on forever, I'm going to skip that, even though it's, it's un, there are unusual twists and turns. And I will say, just quickly, and can tell you more if you want to know, that both in my own career and in other people that I'm aware of, it seems like unusual is in fact usual. That it's always some weird, I didn't think it was going that way thing, and then it goes that way. Anyway, I do get hired as an art director at uh, Disneyland, and I worked there for five years uh, uh, producing uh, every kind of broadcast from the park imaginable. TV remotes, uh, radio remotes, this Good Morning America, Good Morning Britain, um, you know, CEO announcing things at 6 o'clock in the morning from the Disneyland Hotel. Lots and lots of broadcast uh, situations. And I have these two assistants, Chris and Rick. Um, not really artists per se, they're worker guys, uh, not rocket scientists to be honest, they're just really great guys who somehow have this Terminator kind of mentality that when they're asked to do something they never come back empty handed. Um, and probably just because I'm you know, lazy or not a very good art director, we always were missing something. Um, you can't load sets into the park when guests are there. So you have to wait till the park closes. In the summer, it doesn't close till 1 a.m. So you're always loading in at 3 in the morning. And in case you didn't already know this, 3 a.m. is the coldest hour of the night. It's way colder than midnight. Anyway, you're loading this stuff in at 3 in the morning and it's like, oh, uh, do we have a podium for the CEO to stand behind and make their speech? Or, oh, we have a podium, but do we have a logo? Or oh, you know what, these hosts are going to, we didn't know about this sun angle at this hour, these hosts are going to have sun, it's going to be bad, do you have some kind of shade thing, or oh, this shot goes straight across through to the trash, can you, do you have any foliage or something that you can put in there? So there just was always something. And so at three in the morning, I would turn to Chris or Rick or both and say, I need X, and they would go away for some period of time, sometimes short, sometimes long, and they would always come back with X and it would work. Um, a little bit of stress, because you're never sure, but they never failed in all the events we did in five years. Um, sometimes at one in the afternoon, some supervisor from tech services or show services or the sign shop or landscaping or decorating would call me and uh, cuss me out because my guys had stolen their stuff. Um, Sebastian Moreno from Decorating, a, Sebastian Moreno aka Maury would call. Getting cussed out by Maury was great for two reasons. One, he's the nicest guy in the world and getting cussed out by him is not really getting cussed out. But the other thing is, um, if somebody's cussing me out at one in the afternoon, what that means is that the event worked at six in the morning when 
national cameras were rolling and the CEO was announcing whatever the Walt Disney Company is doing next. So anyway, Chris and Rick, amazing guys, dot, 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 fast forward. Uh, Long Beach State University. I've got a radio show at the campus radio station, 22 West Radio. Um, and I think we're having some sort of conference or something, I don't remember what it was, but at some point, someday, the general manager asks the assistant general manager, go to the supply closet, get the ice bucket, go up to Carl's Jr., get ice and take it to conference room number X. Uh, because we're having this conference or whatever and we have some arrangement with Carl's Jr. to get ice. So later that day I'm in the conference room for whatever the event is and there's no ice and the GM is just livid at the AGM for failing to get ice and the AGM says there was no ice bucket in the closet. And Chris or Rick would have never said that. That never would have happened with them. I think the, the instruction that the AGM Britain had in her brain, great person, by the way, I'm not really, I don't really mean to diss her with this story, but um, the instruction in her brain was something like, uh, proceed to perform task. If roadblock encountered, terminate task. Uh, and Chris and Rick had the exact opposite instruction in their brains. It was proceed to perform task. If roadblock encountered, take a different road. If all roads are out, invent a helicopter and fly over the river. If this planet has no atmosphere and you can't fly, dig a tunnel under the river. But Chris and Rick would have found an ice bucket. They would have stolen an ice bucket. They would have gotten a busing tray and lined it with a clean uh, trash can liner they would have found a way. If they got to Carl's Jr. and they said, sorry guys, the ice machine's broken today, they would have gone to Pollo Loco and gotten ice. If Pollo Loco said, sorry, the water's out in the, in the USU and, and nobody has ice today, they would have found ice. They would have gone to the dorms and found ice. They would have figured out that for some reason there's an ice machine in the basement of the biology building. They would have made it happen. So this is another story that sounds like I'm not telling you how to get hired, but I think I am actually, I'm telling you how to build this career, is Britain, great person, but she gave up a little easily. And Chris and Rick, for some reason, they just had this internal programming that no matter what this, this guy asks me to do, I'm gonna find a way to make that happen. It's a priceless skill, and I think if you Develop that ability. Again, be the terminator of your career. If, if you're pushing here and it's not working, push harder or push the other way or find another way to go or fly over it or dig under it. But keep going. Keep going to art galleries. Keep going to talks by people at, you know, if it's Blizzard Entertainment speaking somewhere or if it's an art director at an ad agency or a graphic design shop or et cetera, et cetera. You know, you know, there's all these different organizations you can join for illustrators. There's SILA, Society of Illustrators of Los Angeles. Uh, for graphic designers, there's AIGA, American Institute of Graphic Arts, AIGA LA chapter. Um, but there are all these ways for you to connect to people and you don't have to show everybody your portfolio right away, but meet people. You can certainly make it clear that you're a student, that you're trying to build a network that you're learning and I think if you just do everything you possibly can to connect, I know, I know you could fiddle around in this or that lab at Long Beach State and make a really cool thing for a zillion hours because you can make that thing. Um, when you choose to develop your career is up to you. If you want to spend time in labs and do this work after you leave school, I mean, that works. Uh, you know, it, you're not here to jump through hoops for Glenn. I'm just attempting to give you what I think can help you connect to the career that you want. Um, as I keep saying, I think you, you can have an art career at any age. You could do something else for a few years or even for a few decades and you could come back to art. It's totally possible. It's also rare. I think the sooner you can get some kind of traction, get some kind of connection, start building those branches and roots, build those connections, 
the more likely it is that you can find your way to an art career. You don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be the greatest artist. You just have to be willing to pound the pavement. And, uh, you know, again, I told stories where I was reading Hollywood Reporter Daily Variety. You would be reading something different. But whatever it is for your area, just keep at it. Be the Terminator. Uh, don't take no. Keep moving forward. It'll work out. Give me a shout if you want to talk more about any of this and good luck.